Synopsis of the Tenth Tablet The mystery emissary appears to Inky in a dream vision. Inky is told to save mankind through his son Susudra. By subterfuge, Inky directs Susudra to build a submarine. A navigator comes aboard, bringing Earth's seeds of life. Nibiru's approach causes the Whiteland's ice sheet to slip. The resulting tidal wave engulfs the Earth with water. The remaining Anunnaki bewail the calamity from Earth orbit. The waters recede. Susudra's boat rests on Mount Salvation. Descending in a whirlwind, Enlil discovers Inky's duplicity. Inky convinces Enlil it was destined by the creator of all. They use the surviving landing platform as a temporary base. In a creation chamber there, crops and cattle are fashioned. Abundant gold is discovered in the lands beyond the seas. New space facilities are established in the olden lands. They include two artificial mounds and a lion-shaped carving. Nimma offers a peace plan to resolve erupting route rivalries. In Sipper, all the Anunnaki gathered, the day of the deluge they awaited. It was at that time, as the tension of awaiting was mounting, that the Lord Inki, asleep in his quarters, had a dream vision. In the dream vision there appeared the image of a man, bright and shining like the heavens. And as the man Inky approached, Inky saw that the white-haired Galzu he was. In his right hand an engraver's stylus he was holding, and in his left hand a tablet of lapis lazuli, shining smooth he held. And as he approached near enough by Inky's bed to stand, Galzu spoke up and said, Unwarranted your accusations against Enlil were, for only the truth he spoke, and the decision that as Enlil's decision will be known, not he but destiny decreed. Now into your hands fate take, for the earthlings the earth will inherit. Summon your son Susudra without breaking the oath to him the coming calamity reveal. A boat that the watery avalanche can withstand, a submersible one to build him tell, the likes of which on this tablet to you I am showing. Let him in it save himself and his kinfolk, and the seed of all that is useful, be it plant or animal, also take. That is the will of the creator of all, and Galzu in the dream vision with the stylus on the tablet an image drew and placed the engraved tablet by the side of Inky's bed. And after that the image faded, the dream vision ended, and Inky with a shudder awoke. In his bed, Inky for a while lying remained, with wonder the dream vision he pondered. What was there of the meaning, what omen did it hold? Then, as off his bed he stepped, to and behold there was the tablet. What in a mere dream vision he had seen now by his bedside materially was. With trembling hands, the Lord Inky the tablet picked up. A design of a curious shaped boat upon the tablet he saw. By the tablet's edge measuring markings there were, the boat's measures indicating. A stir with awe and hope the Lord Inky by sunrise for his emissaries quickly sent. Find the one called Galzu, to him I must speak, so to them he said. By sundown all came back, to Inky thus reporting, none Galzu to find was able. Galzu, they said, to Nibiru did long ago return. Greatly baffled Inky was, the mystery and its omen to understand he strove. Unravel the mystery he could not, yet the message to him was clear. That night, to the reed, but where Zazudra was sleeping, Inky stealthily went. The oath not breaking, the Lord Inky not to Susudra, but to the hut's wall spoke. Wake up, wake up, to the reed wall Inky was saying. From behind the reed screen he was speaking. When Susudra by the words was awakened, to him Inky from behind the reed screen said, Reed hut, reed hut, to my words pay attention, to my instructions heed pay. On all the habitations over the cities a calamitous storm will sweep. The destruction of mankind and its offspring it will be. This is the final ruling, the word of the assembly by Enlil convened. This is the decision by Anu and Enlil and Nimma spoken. Now heed my words, observe the message that to you I am speaking. Abandon your house, build a boat, spurn possessions, save the life. The boat that you must build, its design and measurements on a tablet are shown. By the reed hut's wall the tablet I shall leave. Make sure 
that the boat shall be roofed throughout. The sun from the inside must not be seen. The tackle must be very strong, the pitch strong and tight to ward off the water. Let the boat be one that can turn and tumble the watery avalanche to survive. In seven days build the boat, into it your family and kinfolk gather. In the boat food and water for drinking heap up, household animals also bring. Then on the appointed day a signal to you shall be, be given. A boat guide who knows the waters by me appointed to you that day will come. On that day the boat you must enter, its hatch tightly closed you must. An overwhelming deluge coming from the south, lands and life shall devastate. Your boat from its moorings it shall lift, the boat it shall turn and tumble. Fear not, to a safe heaven the boat guide will navigate you. By you shall the seed of civilized mankind survive. When Inky's voice fell silent, Agag was Sasudra. On his knees prostrate he fell. My lord, my lord, he shouted, your voice I heard, let me see your face. Not to you, Sasudra, have I spoken. To the reed wall did I speak, so Inky said. By Enlil's decision, by an oath upheld, and I bound to that all the Anunnaki swore, if my face you shall see, surely like all earthlings you will die. Now reed hut to my words pay heed. The purpose of the boat, a secret of on the Anunnaki with you must remain. When the townspeople will inquire to them you will say, so say, the Lord Enlil with my Lord Inki has angry been. To Inki's abode in the Abzu I am selling, perchance Enlil will be appeased. For a while a silence followed. Sasudra from behind the reed wall came. A tablet of lapis lazuli in the moonlight shining he saw and picked up. The image of a boat upon it was drawn, notches its measurements gave. Wisest a civilized man was Sasudra, what he had heard he understood. In the morning to the townspeople he so announced, The Lord Enlil with the Lord Inki my master angry has been. On that account to me the Lord Enlil is hostile. In this city I no longer reside can, nor in the Eden my foot any more set. To the Abzu, the Lord Inki's domain, I will there a selling go. In a boat that must quickly be built, I will away from here depart. Thereby the Lord Enlil's anger will subside, hardships will end. Upon you the Lord Enlil abundance henceforth will shower. The morning was not yet gone when the people about Sasudra gathered. To speedily for him the boat build they each other encouraged. Timbers of boat wood the elders were hauling, the little ones bitumen from the marshes carried. As woodworkers for planks together hammered, Sasudra in a cauldron the bitumen melted. With bitumen the boat he waterproofed inside and out. As in the drawing upon the tablet, the boat on the fifth day was completed. Eager to see Sasudra depart, the townspeople to the boat food and water brought. From their own mouths substance they took, to appease Enlil they were in a hurry. Four-legged animals into the boat were also driven, birds from the field by themselves flew in. Into the boat Sasudra his spouse and sons made in bark, their wives and children also came. And who to the abode of the Lord Inki wished to go, let them too aboard come. So did Sasudra to the gathered people announce. Envisioning in Lil's abundance, only some of the craftsmen the call heeded. On the sixth day, Ninagal, lord of the great waters, to the boat came. A son of Inki he was, to the boat's navigator he was selected. A box of cedar wood in his hands he held, by his side in the boat he kept it. The life essences and life eggs of living creatures it contains by the Lord Inki and Ninma collected. From the wrath of Enlil to be hidden to life resurrect if earth be willing. So did Ninagal to Sasudra explain. Thus were all beasts by their twos in the boat hidden. Now Ninagal and Sasudra in the boat the arrival of the seventh day awaited. In the 120th Shar was the deluge awaited. In the tenth shar in the life age of Sasudra was the deluge forthcoming. In the station of the constellation of the line was the avalanche looming. Now this is the account of the deluge that over the earth swept, and how the Anunnaki escaped and how Sasudra in the boat survived. For days before the day of the deluge the earth was rumbling, groan as with pain it did. For nights before the calamity struck in the heavens Nibiru as a glowing star was seen. Then there was darkness in daytime, 
and at night the moon as though by a monster was swallowed. The earth began to shake by a net force before unknown it was agitated. In the glow of dawn a black cloud arose from the horizon. The morning's light to darkness changed as though by death's shadow veiled. Then the sound of a rolling thunder boomed, lightning the skies lit up. Depart, depart, Utu to the Anunnaki gave the signal. Crouched in the boats of heaven, the Anunnaki heavenward were lofted. In Shurabak, 18 leagues away, the bright eruptions by Ninagal were seen. Button up, button up the hatch, Ninagal to Sasudra shouted. Together the trap door that the hatch concealed they pulled down. Watertight, enclosed completely was the boat. Inside, not a ray of light penetrated. On that day, on that unforgettable day, the deluge with a roar began. In the Whiteland, at the earth's bottom, the earth's foundations were shaking. Then, with a roar to a thousand thunders equal off its foundations, the ice sheet slipped. By Nibiru's unseen net force, it was pulled away into the South Sea, crashing. One sheet of ice into another ice sheet was smashing. The Whiteland's surface, like a broken eggshell, was crumbling. All at once a tidal wave arose, the very skies was the wall of waters reaching. A storm, its ferocity never before seen, at the earth's bottom began to howl. Its winds, the wall of water, were driving, the tidal wave northward was spreading. Northward was the wall of waters onrushing, the Abzu lands it was reaching. Therefrom, toward the settled lands it traveled, the Eden it overwhelmed. When the tidal wave, the wall of waters, Shurabak reached, the boat of Sasudra, the tidal wave from its moorings lifted. Tossed it about like a watery abyss, the boat it swallowed. Though completely submerged, the boat held firm, not a drop of water into it did enter. Outside the storm's wave, the people overtook like a killing battle. No one his fellow man could see, the ground vanished, there was only water. All that once on the ground stood by the mighty waters away was swept. Before day's end, the watery wall, gathering speed, the mountains overwhelmed. In their celestial boats, the Anunnaki, the earth, were circling. Crowding the compartments against the outer walls, they crouched. What was happening upon the earth, down below, to see they strained. From the celestial boat in which she was, Nimma, like a woman in travail, cried out, my created like drowned dragonflies in a pond the waters fill. All life by the rolling sea wave away was taken, thus did Nimma cry and moan. Inanna, who was with her, also cried and lamented. Everything down below, all that lived, has turned into clay. Thus did Nimma and Inanna weep. They wept and eased their feelings. In the other celestial boats, the Anunnaki by the sight of unbridled fury were humbled. A power greater than theirs they with all those days witnessed. For the fruits of earth they hungered, for fermented elixir they thirsted. The olden days, alas, to clay have turned, to each other the Anunnaki said. After the immense tidal wave that over the earth swept, the sluices of heaven opened and a downpour from the skies upon the earth was unleashed. For seven days the waters from above with the waters of the great below were mingled. Then, the wall of water, its limits reaching, its onslaught ceased, but the rains from the skies for forty more days and nights continued. From their perches the Anunnaki looked down. Where there were dry lands now was a sea of water, and where mountains once to the heavens their peaks raised, their tops now like islands were in the waters, and all that on the dry lands was living in the avalanche of waters perished. Then, as in the beginning, the waters to their basins were gathered. Waving back and forth, day by day the water level came lower. Then, forty days after the deluge over the earth swept, the rains also stopped. After the forty days, Sasudra, the boat's hatch, opened his whereabouts to survey. A bright day it was, a gentle breeze was blowing. All along, all alone, with no other sign of life, the boat upon a vast sea was lolling. Mankind, all living things off the earth's face are wiped out. No one except us few survived, but there is no dry land to set a foot upon. So did Sasudra to his kinfolk say as he sat down and lamented. At that time, Ninagal, by Inki appointed, the boat toward the twin peaks of Arata directed. A sail for her he shaped toward the Mount of Salvation he the boat guided. Impatient Sasudra was, 
birds that were on board he released. To check for dry land for surviving vegetation to verify he sent them. He sent forth a swallow. He sent forth a raven. Both to the boat returned. He sent forth a dove with a twig from a tree to the boat it returned. Now, Sasudra knew that the dry land from under the waters had emerged. A few more days and the boat by rocks was arrested. The deluge is over. At the Mount of Salvation we are, so did Ninigal to Sasudra say. Opening the watertight hatch from the boat, Sasudra emerged. The sky was clear, the sun was shining, a gentle wind was blowing. Hurriedly upon his spouse and children he to come out called. The Lord Inky let us praise, to him thanks give, to them Sasudra said. With his son's stones he gathered, with them an altar he built. Then a fire on the altar he lit, with aromatic incense he made a fire. A ewe lamb, one without blemish, for a sacrifice he selected, and upon the altar to Inky the ewe lamb as a sacrifice he offered. At that time Enlil from his celestial boat to Inky words conveyed, let us, in the whirlwinds from the celestial boats upon the peak of Arata descend, the situation to review, what to be done to determine. While the others in their celestial boats the earth to circuit continued, Enlil and Inki in whirlwinds upon the peak of Arata descended. Smiling, the two brothers met, with joy their arms they locked. Then Enlil, by the whiffs of fire and roasting meat, was puzzled. What is that? to his brother he shouted. Has anyone the deluge survived? Let us go and see, meekly to him, Inky responded. In their whirlwinds to the other peak of Arata they flew over. The boat of Sasudra they saw, by the altar that he had built they landed. Every earthling had to perish, he with fury shouted, and Inky with anger he lunged. To kill his brother with his bare hands he was ready. He is no mere mortal, my son he is, Inky to Sasudra pointing cried out. For a moment Enlil was hesitating. You broke your oath at Inky, he shouted. To a reed wall I spoke, not to Sasudra, Inky said, then to Enlil the dream vision related. By then, by Ninigal alerted, Ninurta and Ninma in their whirlwinds also touched down. When the account of events they heard, Ninurta and Ninma by the account were not angered. The survival of mankind, the will of the creator of all must be, so did Ninurta to his father say. Ninma, her necklace of crystals, a gift of Anu, touched and swore, On my oath, the annihilation of mankind shall never be repeated. Relenting, Enlil by the hands of Sasudra and Imzara, his spouse, took and blessed them thus, Be fruitful and multiply, and the earth replenish. Thus were the olden times ended. Now this is the account of how survival on earth was restored, and how a new source of gold and other earthlings beyond the oceans were found. It was after the encounter at Arata that the waters of the deluge to recede continued, and the face of the earth gradually from under the waters was showing. The mountain lines were mostly unscathed, but the valleys under mud and silt were buried. From the celestial boats and from the whirlwinds, the Anunnaki, the landscapes, surveyed. All that in the olden times in the Eden and the Abzu had existed under the mud was buried. Iridu, Nibriki, Shurabak, Sippar, all were gone, completely vanished. But in the Cedar Mountains, the great stone platform in the sunlight glistened. The landing place in the olden times established was still standing. One after another the whirlwinds upon the platform landed. The platform was intact. At the launch corner the huge stone blocks held firm. Clearing debris and tree branches away, the first to land to the chariots signaled. One after the other the celestial chariots came, upon the platform they touched down. Then to Marduk on the Mu and Nenar on the moon words were sent. And they too to earth returned, upon the landing place they came down. Now the Anunnaki and Agigi who were thus gathered by Enlil to assembly were called. The deluge we have survived, but the earth is devastated, so did Enlil to them say. All ways to recover we must assess, be it on earth, be it elsewhere. Lamu, by the passage of Nibiru, was devastated, so did Marduk relate. Its atmosphere was sucked out, its waters thereafter evaporated, a place of dust storms it is. 
The moon by itself life cannot sustain, only with eagle mask is staying enabled. So did Nanar to the other's account give, and then words of enamor he added, once there that it was Tiamat's host leader one must recall, of earth a companion it is, with it earth's destiny is connected. Lovingly Enlil on his son's shoulders his arm put, with survival now we are concerned. So did Enlil to Nanar mildly retort, now sustenance is our first concern. Let us the sealed creation chamber examine, perchance Nibiru's seeds we shall still find. So did Enlil to Inki say, of the grains once created him reminding. At the side of the platform, clearing some mud, the shaft from times remote they found. The stone that blocked it they lifted up or off the sanctuary they entered. The diorite chest with seals were fastened, the seals with a copper key they made open. Inside the chest, in crystal vessels, the seeds of Nibiru's grain were there. Once outside, to Ninurta Enlil the seeds gave, to him he was thus saying, Go, the mountainside terrace, let the grains of Nibiru once again bread provide. In the cedar mountains, on other mountains too, Ninurta waterfalls damned. Terraces constructed the eldest son of Susudra to raise crops he taught. To Ishkur, his youngest, Enlil another task assigned. Where the waters have receded, go and remaining fruit-bearing trees find. To him, a f as fruit cultivator, Susudra's youngest son was assigned. The first fruit they found, the vine that by Ninma was brought it was. Of its juice, as the Ananaxi's elixir renowned, Susudra took a sip. By one sip, then another, and another, Susudra was overpowered. Like a drunkard, he fell asleep. Then a gift to Ananaki and Earthlings Inki presented. The chest that Ninagal had carried he unveiled is surprising contents to all he announced. The life essences and life eggs in the wombs of the four-legged animals from Susudra's boat can be combined. Sheep for wool and meat will multiply. Cattle for milk and hides will all have. Then with other living creatures the earth we shall replenish. To Dumuzi, the sheep herding task Inki gave, in the task was Susudra's middle son assisting. Then, to the dark hued landmass where his and his son's domains had been, Inki his attention turned. With Ninagal, at the confluence of mighty waters, the mountains he dammed. Fierce waterfalls to a lake he channeled to let the waters as a lake accumulate. Then, the lands between the Abzu and the Great Sea with Marduk he surveyed. Where habitations once were, the river's valley had how to drain, he considered. At midstream, where the river's waters cascaded, an island from the waters he raised. In its bowels, twin caverns he carved out, above them from stone sluices he fashioned. From the two channels in the rocks he cut, for the waters two narrows he fashioned. Thus, the flowing waters from the highlands coming he could slow or let go faster. With dams and sluices and the two narrows, the waters he regulated. Raised from the cavern island, the island of Abu, the river's serpentine valley from under the waters he raised. In the land of the two narrows for Demuzi and the shepherds a habitation did Inki fashion. With satisfaction did Enlil all this to Nibiru words send, with word of concern Nibiru responded. The close passage that Earth and Lamu affected on Nibiru too much, too much damage caused. The shield of gold dust was torn, the atmosphere was dwindling again. Now new supplies of gold quickly were needed. Fervently to the Abzu Inki went, with Gibble his son to survey and search he journeyed. All the gold mines were gone, by the avalanche of water they were buried. In the Eden, Bad Tibera too no longer existed, in Sipper a place for the chariots was no more. The hundreds of Anunnaki who in the mines at An Bad Tibera toiled from the earth were gone. The multitude of earthlings as primitive workers serving by the deluge were to clay turned. No gold can from earth any more be provided, so did Enlil and Inki to Nibiru announce. On earth and on Nibiru there was desperation. At that time Ninurta, his task in the mountains of cedars completed, to the mountainland beyond the oceans once again journeyed. From that land, on the other side of earth, astounding words he delivered. The avalanche of waters, deep cuts into the mountains there tore. 
from the mountainsides uncounted gold in nuggets large and small to the rivers below fell down without mining can the gold be hauled. Enlil and Inky to the distant mountain land hurried with amazement they the discovery viewed. Gold, pure gold, refining and smelting not requiring, all about was lying. A miracle it is, so was Inky to Enlil saying. What by Nibiru was wrought, by Nibiru was amended. The unseen hand of the creator of all, it is life on Nibiru to enable, so did Enlil say. Now who could collect the nuggets? How to Nibiru they will be sent, the leaders each other ask. Of the first question, Ninurta had the answer. In the high mountain land on this side of earth, some earthlings have survived. Descendants of Cain they are, with the handling of metals they are knowing. Four brothers and four sisters are their leaders on rafts they themselves saved. Now their mountaintop in the midst of a great lake is an island. As the protector of their forefathers they me recall, the great pr protector they call me. By the report that other earthlings had survived the leaders were heartened. Even in Lil, who the end of all flesh planned, was no longer angered. It is the will of the creator of all to each other they said. Now let us a new place for celestial chariots establish, therefrom the gold to Nibiru send. For a new plain with soil has dried and hardened they searched. In the proximity of the landing place in a desolate peninsula such a plain they found. Flat as a quiet lake it was, by white mountains it was surrounded. Now this is the account of the new place of the celestial chariots and the artificed twin mountains and how the image of the lying by Marduk was usurped. In the peninsula by the Anunnaki chosen, the heavenly ways of Anu and Enlil on earth were reflected. Let the new place of the chariots precisely on that boundary be located. Let the heart of the plain the heavens reflect, so did Enlil to Inki suggest. Once Inki to this agreed, Enlil from the skies of distances took measures. On a tablet, a grand design for all to see, he marked out. Let the landing place in the Cedar Mountains be a part of the facilities, he said. The distance between the landing place and the chariot place he measured. In the midst thereof, a place for a new mission control center he designated. There, a suitable mount he selected, the Mount of Way Showing, he named it. A platform of stones, akin but smaller than the landing place, to be built there he ordered. In its midst a great rock was carved inside and out to house a new bond heaven earth it was made. A new navel of the earth, the role of Nibruki before the deluge to replace. The landing path on the twin peaks of Arata in the north were anchored. To demarcate the landing corridor in Lil two other sets of twin peaks required. To delimit the landing corridor's boundary, ascent and descent to secure. In the southern part of the desolate peninsula, a place of mountains, twin adjoining peaks in Lil selected, on them the southern delimit he anchored. Where the second set of peaks was required, mountains there were none. Only a flat land above the water-clogged valley from the ground protruded. Artificial peaks thereon we can raise, so did Ningazita to the leaders say. On a tablet the image of a smooth-sided, skyward rising peaks for them he drew. If it can be done, let it so be, Enlil with approval said. Let them also as beacons serve. On the flat land above the river's valleys, Ningazita a scale model built. The rising angles and four smooth sides with it he perfected. Next to it a larger peak he placed, its sides to earth's four corners he set. By the Anunnaki with their tools of power were its stones cut and erected. Beside it, in a precise location, the peak that was its twin he placed. With galleries and chambers for pulsating crystals he designed it. When this artful peak to the heavens rose, to place upon it the capstone the leaders were invited. Of Electrum, an admixture by Gibble fashioned, was the apex stone made. The sunlight to the horizon it reflected, by night a pillar of fire it was. The power of all the crystals to the heavens in a beam it focused. When the artful works by Ningazita designed were completed and ready, the Anunnaki leaders the great twin peak entered. At what they saw they marveled. Ecker, house which, like a mountain is, they named it, a beacon to the heavens it was. 
that the Anunnaki, the deluge, survived and prevailed forever, it proclaimed. Now the new pat place of the celestial chariots, gold from across the seas, can receive. From it, the chariots to Nibiru, the gold for survival, shall carry. From it to the east, where the sun on the designated day rises, they will ascend. To it, to the southwest, where the sun on the designated day sets, they will descend. Then, in Lil, by his own hand, the Nibiru crystals activated. Inside, eerie lights began to flicker. An enchanting hum, the stillness broke. Outside, the capstone all at once was shining, brighter than the sun it was. The multitude of assembled Anunnaki, a cry of joy uttered. Ninma, by the occasion moved, a poem recited and sang. House that is like a mountain, house with a pointed peak, for heaven earth it is equipped, the handiwork of the Anunnaki it is. House bright and dark, house of heaven and earth, for the celestial boats it was put together by the Anunnaki built. House whose interior with a reddish light of heaven glows, a pulsating beam that far and high reaches it emits. Lofty mountain of mountains, great and lofty fashioned, beyond the understanding of earthlings it is. House of equipment, lofty house of eternity, in the foundation stones the waters touch, its great circumference in clay is set. House whose parts are skillfully together woven, the great ones who in the skies circle to a resting make descent. House that for the rocket ships is a landmark with unfathomable insides by Anu himself is the Ecker blessed. Thus did Ninma at the celebration recite and sing. While the Anunnaki, their remarkable handiwork, were celebrating, Inki to Enlil words of suggestion said, When in future days it will be asked, When and by whom has this marvel been fashioned? Let us beside the Twin Peaks a monument create. The age of the lion, let it announce. The image of Ningazita, the peak's designer, let its face be. Let it precisely toward the place of the celestial chariot's gaze. When, by whom, and the purpose let it to the future generations reveal. So did Inki to Enlil suggest. To the words Enlil consented, and to Inki said, Of the place of the celestial chariots, Utu must again be the commander. Let the gazing lion, precisely eastward facing, with Ningazita's image be, when the work to cut and shape the line from the bedrock was proceeding, Marduk, to his father Inki, words of aggrievement said, To dominate the whole earth to me did you promise. Now command and glory to others are granted, without task or dominion I am left. In my erstwhile domain are the artificed mounts situated. On the lion the image mine must be. By these words of Marduk, Ningazita was angered. The other sons were also annoyed. By the clamor for domains, Ninurta and his brothers were also aroused. Lands for themselves and devoted earthlings everyone was demanding. Let not the celebration a contest become. Ninma amidst the raised voices shouted, The earth is still in havoc. We Anunnaki are few. Of the earthlings are our only survivors. Let Marduk, Ningazita of the honor not deprive. Let us Marduk's words also heed. So did Ninma, the peacemaker, to the contending leaders say. For peace to prevail, the habitable lands between us should be a part set, Enlil to Inki said. To make the peninsula an uncontested divider, they agreed. To the peacemaker Ninma, they it allotted. Till moon, land of the missiles, they named it. To earthlings, it was beyond bounds. The habitable lands to the east thereof to Enlil and his offspring were set apart. For the descendants of two sons of Sasudra, Shem and Yafet, therein to dwell. The dark-hued landmass that the Abzu included to Inki and his clan was for domains granted. The people of Sasudra's middle son, Ham, to inhabit it were chosen. To make Marduk their lord of their lands, the master Inki to appease his son suggested. By your wor wish, let it so be, Enlil to Inki about it said. Until moon, in its mountains, mountainous south, an abode for Ninma, his mother Ninurta, built. Near a spring with date trees, a verdant valley it was located. The mountain peak Ninurta terraced, a fragrant, fragrant garden for Ninma he planted. When all was thus completed, a signal to all outposts on earth was given. From the mountain lands across the ocean, whirlwinds the gold nuggets brought. 
From the place of the celestial chariots to Nibiru the gold was lofted. On that memorable day Enlil and Enki to each other said and agreed, let us, Ninma, the peacemaker, with a new epitaph name honor. Ninharzag, mistress of the mountain head, let us name her. By acclamation was Ninma the honor given. Henceforth, Ninharzag, she was called. Praise to Ninharzag on earth the peacemaker, in unison the Anunnaki proclaimed. <laughs>